Why do you do anything? All right. Um, this is not going to be as controversial or as technical as System D. So maybe there's some like shucks and some, ah, oh, sweet. Um, but uh, hopefully it will be useful and entertaining anyways. Uh, I'm going to talk about how to find a great person to work on your project, the contributors. But also, I'm going to talk to those of you who are thinking about contributing to a project on how to find a good project to work on. I used to always give this talk from the point of view only from the projects. And I have a colleague, Shauna Gordon McKeon, who always gives the talk to people who are considering contributing. And we realized that they were basically the same talk inside out. So I've sort of combined them. Um, first of all, this is a quote from Shauna, uh, don't put up with any crap. So if you are considering contributing to a project, giving your time and effort and sweat and tears, et cetera, for free to a project, and they aren't nice to you, find another one. That's my first piece of advice. Um, uh, respect, people know who Aretha Franklin is here, right? Yes? OK. I'm not going to actually sing. Maybe later at the bar, we'll see. Uh, but respect, if you. If you're not sure what I mean by crap, then you, uh, in the positive, you should be always giving your contributors respect. And as contributors, we should always be expecting respect from the projects that we are giving our time and energy and passion to. Uh, and uh, another little note, um, I can code. I, it's not very well. Uh, uh, and so I, one of the things that I do for the free software community is that I, I don't send them my code. Instead, I participate in lots of other ways. So I help people sometimes who are not quite sure on how this whole patent thing works or don't know whether or not they should blog or how to dress up their websites so that people actually know what their project does. So uh, I think code, oh, we lost one. What was here was a picture of Karen, I think, um, and, uh, and some other folks that were doing some non-code tasks. I'll uh, chalk that up to me and LibreOffice, not quite connecting. But um, uh, if you get folks that do non-code work for your projects, then you get all kinds of exciting things like a, a cake with a giant GNU on it, someone to wear the weird orange fox costume and take pictures with people, and you get nice graphics, you might get blog posts. If you're really lucky, you'll get someone to help you do fundraising so that you can pay more developers. So that was there. Um, so first I'm going to speak mostly to projects. Uh, when a project has contributors with lots of different skills, oh, maybe we'll get it here. Oh, there's Karen. <laughs> um, so I don't know what we missed on the other one. Uh, anyway, like I said, better parties, better graphics, maybe fundraising, uh, legal advice, uh, when we can bring lawyers over to our side, which we, we highly appreciate. So uh, I think a successful software project needs to have uh, many people helping, not only on code. So when I speak about contributors, I'm speaking about all types of contributors. Uh, so when you see coders doing tasks that are maybe not feeling natural to them, uh, you end up with a lot of like kind of grim stuff. Uh, do people remember seeing this picture on the internet? This is a prime example of someone doing something that isn't really in their wheelhouse. And you can see the result. It's not good. So if, if you know that you're a person who isn't good at writing or isn't good at graphics or doesn't think of yourself as a people person, don't do those tasks for your project. Find someone who does like doing those tasks, like a painter or uh, what have you, and have them do it for you. So. Uh, how do you go about finding these folks? I would say to start up a communication with them as soon as possible. And that means that your email on your website, like the info at yourproject.com or .org, has to be a real email that people answer. It can't be the spam account. I know a couple of projects do this. Uh, or like one where you, uh, you do everything else for like your six month period and then you go and see what's in the info queue. 
I'm not going to call anyone out, but uh, if you do want people to help you with your project, then uh, your first line of communication has to be a real line of communication. Uh, and, you know, your website, there used to be, do people know the Twisted Project? So uh, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a Python project, and they used to have this website that listed like all of the components, but it never actually said what the project did. And so anyone who was interested and interested had no way of knowing if they were interested. And so I, I asked the developer about it, the lead developer who uh, happened to be at my Python meetup. He used to live in Boston. And I said, hey, so what does Twisted do? And he said, take a look at the website. And I looked at this list of components and I said, I still have no idea what Twisted is. And uh, he said, oh gosh. Well, maybe everyone who needs Twisted already knows about it. And I said, really? Like, like they left the womb, like knowing that they should go and look for the Twisted project because they'd eventually grow up to be a sysadmin that wanted to catalog logs. Okay, I, I think that's not likely. So if your website is not saying what your project is, then you aren't doing a great job. Uh, going further to make it even function as more of a welcome wagon is thinking about how it would look to someone who doesn't know uh, what you are or that you are looking for contributors. So if you do want contributors, when people come to your website, it should say so. It should say so like maybe in big, maybe not quite obnoxious flashing letters, but it should be very readily apparent that you want all kinds of contributors. And not just code contributors, so uh, when we blog at Media Goblin, which is one of the projects I work on, uh, every time we thank contributors, we always thank our translators and our writers and people who helped us with fundraising and people who helped us order stickers and do all of those different things. So it's, it's very obvious when you come to the Media Goblin website that we are open to having any, any type of contribution, that we're very excited to have you there. Uh, and a healthy project will be happy to help new people. So uh, some projects have um, like a, a technical channel and that's like the first place that you can go on IRC is their development channel. And so what happens is people download their software and they use it and then they try to figure out how to contact the project and then they contact the development channel or the development mailing list. And those folks, if they want to also be the welcome wagon, awesome, but if they don't, then you need to make sure there's another place for people to go, like an info or a user help or something like that. And um, one of the things that I think is really critical if you are getting sick of answering like the 101 types of questions about your project is to make a really good up-to-date FAQ so that people can go get the answers to those questions themselves instead of you know, making you tired of answering, like, oh, where's the repo? Like, oh, it's, uh, shoot, um, it's, here, let me give it to you again. Um, it should be on the website. So there's, I understand that sometimes there can be, like, some, like, fatigue dealing with brand new people who don't know anything yet, uh, but if you can offload those questions into an FAQ, then you can talk to people after they're like, oh, I figured out what, you, what your project does, I figured out where the repo is, I figured out what kind of contributions you want, and then you can have like, oh, I'm so glad you're here, because you're still excited even after you learned all those things. So, welcoming. Um, a little bit more on the coders and non-coders. Uh, they're kind of the same, but like, have folks seen this, the Maslow's hierarchy of needs? This is like a, yeah. So uh, this is like all human beings. And so if you, I mean, if you have non-human contributors, I'm not speaking to that. But um, we do a really good job on the top of the pyramid, like self-actualization, which is like learning how to do new stuff and feeling like a smart, competent person. And so we usually, offer a lot of that when people come and contribute to our projects. We're like, oh, I'll teach you like a new programming language or you'll learn a new framework or, you know, whatever the details of your particular project are. Um, 
But the rest are just as important, in, in fact, sometimes more important because people can't get to that top part without the bottom pits. So uh, esteem is like we, we do a lot of recognition at Media Goblin, uh, and we do a lot of thanking people for their contributions. Uh, social, if you, you know, if you're not putting on like a several thousand person conference, then maybe you can just have lunch for your contributors at the conference someone else put on and make sure your contributors get to meet each other. Uh, and then as you go down, if you have someone in your IRC channel that thinks like say death threats are funny, you have to get rid of that person no one is going to get to the self-actualized like, oh, wow, I, I learned a new programming language. This was awesome. After getting like 19 funny death threats from that person. Uh, so safety is important. Um, if you run an in-person group, I know there are a lot of user groups here. And uh, I met some folks who run a Libre Planet group here. Uh, if you do meetings and you want new people to show up, they can't be at your house. Because a stranger doesn't feel safe at your house and you want your group to grow. So you should consider a public place like a school or a library or a cafe. Uh, and then um, physical stuff like obviously if you have um, people who need vegan food or kosher food and you're going to be hanging out long enough to eat, then you have to provide food for people. You have to provide an accessible way for people to get into the room and that type of thing. So. You know, this is, these, are, these are things that are true for both coders and non-coders. Like everyone, everyone's got to eat, everyone's got to feel safe in order to be in the right space to learn stuff and, and be a good contributing member of your community. Uh, but non-coders are also a little different. So if, you, if you're like, oh, I wanna, I want, I'm waiting for her to tell us how we can get people to help us raise money, um, or do writing, or do any of those things, uh, Non-coders tend to be more interested in the how instead of the, um, I mean, the why instead of the how. So like, a lot of times when we're talking with technical folks, we get really bogged down in the how. We're like, oh, it's this particular database and I'm so into Mongo or, you know, this type of thing. And um, someone who was, who's listening who doesn't know what Mongo is or isn't a database person or isn't even a coder, they're like, I don't really care. Like, but if you were to say, like, oh, we're helping um, folks in a resource-constrained environment get access to healthcare information. And it's like, oh, wow, that sounds like you're saving lives. Before it sounded like you were talking about a video game. Now I might want to help out, right? So uh, when you're speaking to folks that aren't going to help you on the technical part, you want to let them know what's exciting about the impact that your project has on the world. All right, so teamwork makes the dream work. This one is, um, I don't know if people have seen Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. It's a US movie. They have a, they have a mantra for the salespeople, which is always be closing. But I think the mantra for us in free software is to always be including. So if you have different kinds of people working on your projects and you want to always be inviting everyone and making sure that you're not having a meeting where 29 members of your project are there and one isn't. So that's, because that's weird, even if they're, you know, they're your like one non-technical person. Um, you look at this, how happy does it feel to be on the team, right? And so uh, it's any kinds of ways that you can make people feel like they're a part of your team are gonna help them stick around. And uh, involving them in the conversations, involving them in the decision making. If you do have a little conference or meeting uh, for your project, then you know maybe you've got like two tracks of technical and one track of uh, design or outreach, and l let them self-organize, but give them space to do that within your event. So they're like not like oh the technical people are having this super fun conference, and you know we're going to eat pizza and hang out, and uh, we'll see you guys next week, which is. That doesn't feel like part of the team, right? Uh, one of the other things that I also like to do uh, to make people feel part of the team is verbose introductions. So if I was to say like, oh, this is Sarah, she works on Media Goblin. Like, yeah, that's well, okay, I introduced you. But if I said, oh, this is Sarah, she's the one that redid the Django-like framework, which was, must have been a total pain in the butt, but she did it, must have taken her hours. Sarah's awesome, basically, meet Sarah. 
Like, Sarah might now feel like, kind of like, all right, you know, uh, yeah, okay, hi, I'm Sarah, like, that was awesome. I, little, little onions in here. Um, so the verbose introduction is so much more effective, right, than the like, oh yeah, Sarah. Like, hmm. <laughs> and because you're doing it in front of someone else, you're saying to another person, like, this is a valuable, you know, a valuable member of our team. And, you know, we couldn't do what we do without her. So I think those are really important. Uh, another thing that you might do uh, to recognize people, I like to give people titles if they want them, like if they'll accept them. Not, not bad titles, nicknames are another thing. But if someone has been doing like all of your bug triage, then you should call them the boss of bugs or, or something. You'd let them pick a fun title. Or if they're doing all of your press work, then you can call them your press liaison. Uh, and it, it could be fun, it could be goofy, as long as, I mean, it has to be a title they want, <laughs> obviously. Uh, but this costs you nothing. Like, introducing people verbosely, uh, letting people have a title within your uh, community for volunteer work that they're doing, it costs you nothing. But the reward is great. Uh, and so I, I would encourage everyone to do that within your projects. Uh, so where to look for these new contributors, right? And like, I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm going to introduce the hell out of them, I'm going to give them titles, like where do I find them? So um, this is uh, not based on data, this is just a visualization. I think, so where people come from, the core contributors don't usually show up and say like, I've been, you know, stalking your project for five years and I'm ready to you know, do like 30 hours a week of free work for you now. They don't, that's not, that doesn't happen. It would be nice if they did, but they don't. Maybe for paid stuff, but um, you have like kind of this outer layer where first people have to have like heard of your project and that's where having a good website comes in. Then, you know, they, they download the software or they interact with it on the website and they start using it. And if they like it, because you've done a great job with your user experience, then they start recommending it to other people. They're like, oh, I'm using this great thing. It's free, and, uh, and I love it. And then maybe, you know, as they become more invested, and if you've done a good job of letting them know that they can submit bugs, then they start submitting bugs, which is great, because then you get feedback on how your users are using your software. And then, Hopefully, they keep doing the bugs. You have them come in, maybe help them close some bugs for you. And, you know, we'll do like a, an amazing kind of movie style montage and eventually a couple of them become core contributors. So, how does that happen? I've made this a uh, funnel. Are people familiar with this? Like, so for websites, when you're doing sales, you have the idea of like all the people that visit the website and then like a small number of them like actually put something in the shopping cart and then a smaller number fill out the 20 pages of information you want and then actually end up giving you money. So this, think of that, like this is the funnel for getting core contributors. Um, a lot of projects have like sort of an invisible barrier here. And it could be any number of things, like maybe your users and recommenders don't know that you have a bug tracker even, because it's not linked anywhere. Or they think that the bug tracker is only for like super elite, like technical experts, like maybe people who have already contributed like a thousand lines of code. They don't know you want bugs from just users. Um, or they have this thing where they feel, oh, well, what if I do the bug wrong and then like one of those internet mean things happens where I'm like the lady who filed the stupid bug. Like that's real. I mean hopefully not the lady who filed the stupid bug but the way the internet is is like you don't want to mess up there, right? It's, it's kind of terrifying. And so a couple of things that you can do make it really obvious. One, that you have a bug tracker. Uh, be really clear about who can submit those bugs and then provide a sample bug so that people know, oh, I see what the format is. I do this and then this and then this. I expect to be contacted within this amount of time. Now I have a reasonable expectation that if I file a bug, it will, I won't have done it wrong. It will be, it will be a correct and possibly useful bug. So, um, and you know, there could be 
other, other things going on, but I would ask a friend to try to file a bug on your, on your project. If you, if you are like, oh, only three people file bugs, and they're like, you know, the two people I went to high school with and myself that started the project, then, hmm, it's worth buying someone lunch and having them try to file a bug and see what happens. So, uh, oh, in this, in this thing, I also have this magic, these green X's, these are interns, which are people who don't necessarily start out knowing about your software, but um, will learn at their internship. There are a lot of great internships out there, and I'm gonna talk about that more on the other end, but um, basically, when we talk about the self-actualization, the learning, the like becoming smarter, uh, schools are full of people that want to do those things. So they're really great places to look for people who want to work on your project. Uh, and there are a couple of notable ones, which I'll get to in a bit. Uh, also, if you're having trouble finding people for specific tasks, then you can reach out to your friends or friends, like your folks at your pickup frisbee game or whatever it is that you do that's like a little bit further away from your uh, free software work and see if like, oh, does anyone know how to, you know, do magazine ads? We're thinking of doing one. Or uh, does anyone want to take a crack at posting some stuff on our blog? And so if you ask friends or friends, like, you know, you might have to maybe fix their computer or do something for them or bake them cookies. Uh, but, you know, it's a good trade, I think. So we'll get into them mostly for contributors. I think it's really important to find something that is interesting to you. If you're a contributor looking for a new project, um, and I, I don't recommend working on a project where you don't know what they're doing, like what the impact is in the world, because you're not gonna be very motivated. Like, and you might even find out like it's terrible, they're drowning puppies and they made an app or something, which is like, whew. So, um, so I would find something that is interesting to you and is aligned with your other stuff. So maybe if you're a musician and you're looking for a project to get involved with, then you might try like Music Brains or something like that, where you're like, oh, I know about music, so I'll bring some domain-specific expertise and then I might learn some stuff about software while I'm at it. Or if you're an artist, you can come tell us at Media Goblin like how you think we're doing. Uh, or if, you know, if you're a nurse and you want to work uh, on healthcare stuff, maybe Open MRS would be a great project for you to take a look at. So find something that is interesting to you, not just because like, I hear there's money in that software stuff, because that's, that's not gonna carry through long enough to keep you excited. Uh, a lot of projects will have some hoops and some barriers to entry. Some of those are reasonable and some are, are not. Uh, you should expect to have to sign up for the mailing list. Um, you should expect a project to not give you access to write stuff to the repo immediately. Um, you should not expect to be told we'll get back to you about your patch within a year. That's, that's not an acceptable barrier. Maybe a couple weeks depending on how busy the project is. And you can tell, if, even if a project won't tell you, you can see how long it takes them to get back to other people on their bugs. So, uh, you know, find an acceptable level of uh, barrier to entry. Another thing I think that's really important is seeing if the project's current contributors are happy. Uh, so, um, every project has like its uh, like kind of lost teeth stories and black marks and things that didn't go so well. But if a project has only those kinds of stories, then uh, unless you really love drama, uh, this may not be a great project for you. Uh, it also, I think, when people are constantly like venting or sniping or, uh, you know, crap talking, the project that they're involved with, then it's probably a project that isn't doing a good job of giving people an opportunity to speak up within proper channels. And so, I mean, if you're, I think that a project where you get to lend your expertise, but also your opinion and have some influence on the direction of the project and the processes in getting things done is gonna be more rewarding for you as a contributor. 
so that the that I think that's a red flag when like you find like people X project and they're always at the bar like and then he did this and it was terrible and then this happened and then we had to get rid of him and it's like <sighs> it's like oh anything is there anything good that's happened this year no okay so um, so yeah so look for look for projects where the current contributors have some stories some things they're excited about. Another thing I would look at is, um, are projects teaching people to fish? And uh, maybe you've heard this thing, like if you give someone a fish, then they eat for the day, and if you teach people to fish, then they, uh, they get to eat for a lifetime. Uh, so projects that don't answer people's questions or yell at them for asking questions or uh, just say like, oh, never mind, I'll do it myself all the time, Eventually, you're, you're not really going to learn very many things at a project like that. So I would look for projects that are, uh, that are excited to get questions and excited to help people find the solution and figure out how to do the work themselves. So um, how some other folks have found great projects. Uh, I would say look for a code of conduct or some sort of like, hey, here's our mission and we want people involved. Uh, and there are sample codes of conduct for projects, for software projects online if you want one. Uh, look for participation in outreach programs. Uh, I would say the GNOME, now known as Outreachy, is a fantastic place, whether you get involved either through the internship or you see a project that has clearly done the work to figure out how to bring in new people then you can get involved with them. You know that they already understand how mentoring works. They already understand like what kinds of questions new people are going to have. And they've been vetted by the fine folks at Outreachy. So that's a really great place to find a good project. Another one, so this is a little bit more, Molly made this little graph showing, um, this is particularly for folks who are looking to contribute in a non-code way. And uh, so these are the first seven years of the GNOME Outreach Program for Women project and the percentage of non-coding interns. And uh, so there's, you know, I don't want people to think you have to code to be able to contribute to free software. There are lots of projects that uh, need lots of things besides code. Of course, you can also code. That's, that's fine, too. They'll still take that. Um, Speaking of code, uh, Google Summer of Code does just take coders so far as I'm aware. And, uh, and they also pay money. So in addition, like GNOME pays money, uh, or Outreach you pays money, and Google will pay you money to intern. So, uh, you know, it's, it's not a bad place to start, right? Um, and there are a ton of projects that have been involved with the Google Summer of Code, like previously or currently. and. Uh, all of them have gone through the process of figuring out how to mentor new people and show them what's going on with their code base and answer questions for folks that are like, I have no idea what you guys are doing here, but I showed up to help. So those are all good places to find projects that are prepared for new people. Uh, Open Hatch. Uh, we also have, uh, I'm on the board there, so I'm a little biased. Uh, but we have a directory of bite-sized bugs, so projects that have decided that they would like new contributors to come in, grab bite-sized bugs, become familiar with the whole process of submitting a patch and uh, communicating with the project, and hopefully to do more, but they might just do the bite-sized bugs. And we have a list of recommended projects. We like to call Open Hatch Free Software's Welcoming Committee. Uh, we have the Bite Size Bug database and we do a lot of uh, events where we go to college campuses and help students go from Friday afternoon to Saturday evening and do their first patch. They, they sleep in between. We don't keep them up all night. Um, there are, I know there are hackathons like that, but I'm, I'm a huge fan of sleep and, and we, we are committed to sleep as well. So. Um, Another thing that I think, like I said, at Media Goblin we do this all the time. We post about our non-coding work. So that's, if you're specifically looking for a project that is looking for non-coders, if you take a look at their blog post when they thank people or when they do their release notes, if they are thanking people for their non-coding contributions, then you know that they understand how important those are. So. Um, like I said, there we are, Media Goblin. And you can always, if you don't want to do all that work, you can just kind of contribute at Media Goblin. I will totally accept that. 
we are building a decentralized media hosting platform organized around the individual instead of the data type or the media type. And uh, it's AGPL, it's a GNU project, so you're always welcome over here. <laughs> um, and uh, like I said, I'm, I'm coming to the end, so I'm gonna be happy to answer your questions. I might have spoken quickly. Uh, but again, I wanna leave you with the idea, don't put up with any crap. There are tons and tons and tons of projects out there that need tons of different tasks. So if you show up and you're like, I wanna help you do X, Y, Z, and they're like, mm -hmm. well, it's gonna take us like three weeks to get you access to the repo. And it's like, okay, I'm done, bye, see ya, I'll find something else. Because there are plenty of projects that are gonna be excited to have you. So don't put up with any crap. And I have picture credits, and I would be happy to take your questions about getting people involved. Thanks. Oh, one here. Oh, he speaks English. I'm gonna under, I'm be able to understand Randall's question. Thanks, Nick. Just kidding. A couple of points uh, that occurred to me while I was listening to your talk. Um, one is that uh, when projects are sometimes pitched to Floss Weekly, my show, uh -huh. um, they I go to the website and sometimes it's just like gobbledygook and I end up getting a better idea of the project by going to the, uh, the Wikipedia page about it. Mm -hmm. But that says, that if you don't have your elevator pitch on your front page, if you can't describe what's going on in 30 seconds, it, you, 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 your website's broken and it really is broken. Oh yeah. And the second thing is that uh, in terms of interesting job titles, uh, for my current primary client, most of what I'm doing is going through and looking for all the times they took shortcuts. We call that technical debt. So my job title right now is technical debt collector. <laughs> That's awesome. A funny thing is that, um, so some folks know this, I used to work at the Free Software Foundation. I found the ad on Craigslist, and then I went to fsf.org and I couldn't figure out what it was. The website's much better now. Um, but I went to Wikipedia, and then I was like, oh, I would love to work here. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty bad. I mean, I'm glad Wikipedia is out there, but if that is the best place to find information about your project, then why are you paying for a website, right? Exactly. Thank you. Other questions? Comments? Other stuff? Does anyone want to take a minute to tell us that your project is looking for people? So if there are people looking for projects, they can come find you? Yeah, awesome. Hi, uh, I'm Georgia, and I'm looking for projects. You're looking for projects? Yes. Awesome. Well, well uh, my question is, I am not in, well, how can I say? I am finishing school. I mm -hmm. I make management IT, mm -hmm. and I am not really uh, in the. I don't know a lot of technical things. Like I'm not a programmer. Mm -hmm. I was working as a tester for years, mm -hmm. and I am trying to change my career for something more like business analyst or something like this, mm -hmm. because I am really good to talk and listen and. I, I really like technology, but I am I am more talkative, I would say. So, do you have some tips for me? So, uh, a project you might find really interesting that sort of brings the um, analyzing and the uh, understanding of how software gets built, even if you're not building it, would be uh, Biturgia. And they're based in Spain. And what they do is analytics for free software projects. And it's all free software tools. And so it helps free software projects improve their outreach and their um, support. So they, they just, that's what they do, is they crunch numbers and they build new tools for people to crunch numbers to help them improve their free software projects. Oh, so that one might be fun to check out. I, um, uh, if you're looking for something local, I, I don't know where you live, but um, 
uh, in my town, we have like meetup groups and things like that, and those are really good places to start and find a project that is interested in that specific skill. All right, thank you. Uh, yeah, I might need to to ask you to. Tell me. Yeah, you can email me. All right, because yeah. I couldn't understand the name in Spain. Oh, Deb at Eximius Productions. What? Oh, Biturgia. B i t e r g i a, and their logo is an orange owl, so that's how you know you'll find the right one. B i t. B i t. Yes. E r g i a. And then I see Karen is over here too. Maybe so. All right. Thank you. I'm yeah. Sorry. Thanks so much. No, no. And email me if you want. Uh, if I think of something else, I'll let you know. All right. Thanks. Thanks a lot, and yeah. congratulations. Oh. I just wanted to add that uh, if for, uh, for women and other underrepresented groups here, if you're interested in checking out new projects, when there's the new application process for Outreachy, we have mentors that are available, and people who are not part of underrepresented groups, Outreachy's participants, which has many free and open source software projects, have mentors already listed there. So if you want to get started, contacting those people and looking at those projects are good because they're projects that are looking for help and have people identified as being willing to help you. Yeah, Outreach is a great project. I see a question up in the back, which is a recommendation. Basic, uh, basic how-to stuff. Um, mm -hmm. If you go to uh, blog.treasuredata.com, there's a lot of uh, data science 101, data analytics 101. Um, and the other thing, if you're looking for experience and looking to change careers, and I've actually done this a few times now, uh, the best thing to do is to find an area that you're interested in, find somewhere where you can volunteer that. Um, there's clubs all over Brazil. For example, I've worked with a hacker club in Garoa, if I pronounce that correctly. Um, and go there, find something you want to do, actually do it, and put it on your resume. And then it's a real thing with real value that's going to get, uh, get you mileage in an interview. So those were my yeah. two suggestions. I'm sorry I'm sitting back here flailing my arms <laughs> around, but I've, I've been through this. I know what you have to do. So. Yeah, th that's awesome. Volunteer and then put it on your resume, which is why people need titles, because you can't just... Volunteer is not as compelling as a junior data analyst or something. But effectively, if you do uh, data analysis, you are a data analyst, right? You're just not getting paid yet. Um, so that's an important thing to think. Try to, f try to find an opportunity to actually do the thing that you want to do and do it. Um, and if you can get, you know, kudos and recommendations then uh, from, from that volunteer thing, um, there you go. Cool, thanks. Thank you. Uh, other questions, uh, things people want to let us know about, or uh, comments, advices, etc. One here. Uh, yeah, uh, I just thought it was shared. So, uh, since you asked if there are uh, also projects looking for people. Um, yeah. I thought I would mention because uh, often things are happening around us and we don't know about them. So um, I'm a PhD student uh, in Rio de Janeiro. Mm -hmm. So I work at the Lab Lua department for the Lua programming language, which is a programming language that was created in Brazil and it's used worldwide. And lots, even a lot of people here don't know about it. And uh, so uh, I am the developer of the package manager for, for Lua. So, mm -hmm. which is an open project, which is always welcome for, for it's always welcoming new developers, and uh, we are participating in this year's uh, Google Summer of Code. Mm -hmm. So, uh, well, uh, applications have the the, pro the program has already started for this year, but if anyone's interested, you can always submit uh, apply next year. So, and uh, I'm 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 mentoring students now, and there's always opportunities there, and so I, I would just like drop it here uh, a note cool. about the, the lab and the stuff that we're doing and 
the possibilities there are open there. Uh, and, and of course, the department is also always accepting new students if they want to work with the Lua language as well. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. All right. Anything else? I have no idea how I did on time. I had like, a, like two double expressos today, so I expect it was fast. Okay. All right. Great. Thanks so much, you guys. And go find each other.